Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Book of Ephesians chapter number 1 this evening. And uh, we're going to get our introduction to this uh, great book and start on the scripture here a little bit tonight. Uh, I'm uh, uh, excited about this, and I know that a lot of other people are too, so be sure and listen to everything I'm going to say tonight because the book of Ephesians has a lot of stuff in it that will help us in our daily life, and that's what we need. But at the same time, we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy doctrine, especially tonight. You only hit it in the fourth verse, buddy, and it's just like a bomb, spiritual bomb go off all over the world. But here in the book of Ephesians, you'll notice if your Bible probably says the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. Now, I take it for granted that we have new people in here and some people that haven't been in church very long, so I'll take time to explain these things. Uh, the, an epistle was just their word for letter. So Paul writes this letter to the church of the Ephesians, and it's called in your Bible an epistle. Uh, so an epistle, it would be a letter. When you read the epistle of so-and-so, so-and-so. Now, an apostle was uh, somebody that we identified as chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ and had to see him. All the apostles saw the Lord either during his earthly ministry or after his, his ascension, like Paul did. And uh, they have the apostolic signs, and they were appointed and given apostolic signs. Apostolic signs were signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, they can just do them at will all over the place. Uh, there are no apostles now. I just lost people right now by saying that. But uh, if I'm wrong, come and visit us. We'll pay you a plane ticket and get you here. And you can give us some signs and wonders and help people over in the hospital. And I'll apologize up here next time and say I was wrong. But if you can't do that, then you, you might as well just take it and swallow it. Uh, but I didn't say God can't do miracles. I didn't say God don't do signs and wonders. He can. But I'm saying you are not an apostle. If you're listening to me today, and your wife is surely not. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, I done lost a bunch right there. I wish you'd listen, though. You might learn something. But anyway, it starts out, Paul, an apostle. There's your first words. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He didn't volunteer. He didn't say, I want to become one. The Lord chose him. That's where the ministry is. You don't choose the ministry. You are chosen for the ministry. Uh, people don't grow up and say, you know, what vocation will I pursue? I have all my religious family. I think I'm going to throw into the ministry. No, that ain't the way this works. Uh, you are appointed by the Lord, he said, uh, uh, to be in the ministry. Now, before I read on any further, let me say that uh, the book of Ephesians has six chapters. It was written in about 62 A.D. That means almost 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven. So when you're studying your Bible, you've got to remember that everything they had there in the New Testament was Old Testament. It was happening right then, but they, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all that, and that, so that confuses people a lot of time. They think, they think stuff happened in the event, in the same line it's recorded, but that's not the way it was. It happened... And then it wasn't recorded till here, till uh, 62 A.D. Now, the last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, was written around 90 A.D. So that's almost, well, let's see, it is over 50 years after Christ went back to heaven. So there's progressive revelation through there from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. When Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote, they didn't even have, if he, Paul wasn't even saved. Excuse me, for the, for the most part. Uh, it might have been on one of them. I'm not, I'm not sure about the dates. But anyway, they didn't have the New Testament. So uh, it was a, uh, Ephesus was a town, a city. That's why it says Ephesians. Like uh, America is a country and Americans live here. Ephesus was a city and Ephesians is what they call the people who live there. Uh, there was a river eventually, it was a seaport actually, and a river blocked it off. Uh, but it was a it was a very important city in Paul's time, and had one of the largest theater they say would hold up, up close to fifty thousand people. And there was 
they had this false god, a female deity that they worshipped. Does anybody know the name of that false god? Diana. The greatest Diana of the Ephesians. And they worshipped a female deity. And they they were heathen. They were, they were just plain heathen. And so uh, when Paul got saved, he took these missionary journeys and he'd go in there and sit and preach and he'd start a church. Then he'd go back and write them letters to instruct them. And that's what Ephesians is. One of them letters. So, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Automatically you say, what's a saint? In the Bible, in the New Testament, a saint is anybody who's saved. All the Christians there in Ephesus were called saints. Now, we've got a little bit def we've got a little bit def definition of that, but it's not a Bible definition. You know how many times you hear people, I don't claim to be no saint. Well, well I know what you mean when you say that. But <laughs> me, the truth is, all Christians are saints in the New Testament sense. Uh, like I'm uh, I'm uh, right there, Saint Jim. Uh, that's right, Saint Jim. You say, I don't see it. That's right, the Lord does. Uh, Saint Terry, amen. Uh, amen. Saint Peanut. The uh, uh, Catholic Church ought to canonize her. Uh, and may, uh, but, but the Catholic Church is one that messed up the definition of that. And they make people saints that are dead and gone, that done great miracles and stuff, and probably a lot of politics involved too, and where they come from, country and financial advantage. Uh, and they pray to them. We don't pray to saints. We, we is one. And so I'm Saint Danny. You know, don't call me that. But technically, in the New Testament sense, all Christians are saints, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse two. Grace be to you. That word grace is found twelve times in this book. Grace. Grace is one of the main themes of the book of Ephesians. You're going to see it over and over and over. Not blessings. I mean, we're going to read about blessings in the next verse. But grace is more important than blessings. We sung about blessings a minute ago. Those are temporal, physical blessings. We'll leave what real blessings are in just a second. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look, you ain't been saved long. Learn how to read the Bible. Blessed be the God and Father. That's the same person. It's not God and Father, somebody else. Sometimes we try to read the Bible like it's in new modern day English and that's not the way it's wrote. When he said blessed be God and our father, he means God who is our father and that's just different names for him. Like I am my my kids uh, father and daddy. They can say father and daddy. That's not two people, it's me. And that's what he means here. He said blessed be God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. That's what we sing about a minute ago. But look at this. With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now look. In the Bible, spiritual blessings are way more important than physical blessings. Physical blessings is just what we were singing about a while ago. And it's sad to say most Christians in America are so carnal and so fleshly minded and self-centered that all they think about. Now, if you don't believe me, watch one of them TV preachers. And it's all that, but God will bless me. And, you know, I just sent this offering into here. And God blessed me with a new car. And God blessed me with a new house. And I got my bills paid off. All those are physical blessings. All those are temporal blessings. Now, nothing wrong with being happy. There's nothing wrong with us saying, uh, there's a roof up above me, shoes on my feet. Uh, that's good. Those are, are good things from God. But you do understand, a lot of lost people have shoes on their feet and a roof over their head. Spiritual blessings only come for Christians. Spiritual blessings. Our prayers answered. He walks with us. He leads us day by day. We have the hope. We know what we're doing in this world. We know where we're at. We know where we stand with God. And there's all kinds of spiritual blessings. That's what he said. Spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that term heavenly places found four times in the Bible. And we're, we're seated up there. You know... Do you realize that uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible, uh, how many of y'all, I'm, I'm sure most of y'all know this verse where it said, we are seated together with him in heavenly places. 
right now. We are right now seated with Christ in heavenly places. That means spiritually, we're already there. You ever heard anybody say, uh, well, we're here in the flesh, but we're there in the spirit. Technically, we are seated with him in heavenly places. You say, well, how can we do two places at once? Only a Christian and God can do that. You remember when Jesus when Jesus said, uh, when he told Nicodemus, he said uh, something about you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. Even the son of man which is in heaven. Right then, he's sitting there talking to him on earth. And he said, even the son of man which is in heaven. He's on earth, but he's in heaven too. And uh, I don't claim to understand all that, but I know what it's like sometimes to be sitting in heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all that being said, blam, we're getting ready to hit a bombshell in verse 4. And this will be some doctrine that I'm going to talk about tonight uh, on the doctrine of predestination and election and foreknowledge and, and the sovereignty of God and sovereign grace and Calvin, John Calvin. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do a lengthy study on it. I will sometime. If I was going to do this, I want to do it on Sunday night where a lot more of our people could be here to get this. But honestly, I doubt if anybody here has much trouble with believing this right. But there are people in the world that, uh, Really, 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 really did it. So we'll hit it. Verse 4. Ready? Everybody look at verse 4. This is one of the most controversial doctrines in the history of the Christian church. And it said, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now immediately, you... Uh, are struck with the with the the scripture before the foundation of the world, and there's entire churches, and the doctrine of what we call Calvinist Calvinism, the whole Presbyterian Church, and the Reformed Baptist, and the Primitive Baptist, the old time Primitive Baptist, and right now about a big part of the Southern Baptist. Uh, this doctrine of Calvinism makes a circle about every 10 or 15 years, and it just blows through. I had a preacher friend of mine in Alabama told me, he said, he said, every preacher down here right now is believing in Calvinism. And what they're, what that, basically what it's saying is that before the foundation of the world, before God ever made the world, he sat down and he picked out uh, who was, who was going to be saved, me and you included in, the, in that, in that group. Uh, if you're saved and 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 fix it out and nobody else is going to get saved and that before the foundation see that's what it said chosen in before the foundation of the world now we'll get to that you say well brother Danny it does say that look at it and here's where you got to learn how to read the Bible what does it say chapter chapter uh, chapter 1 verse 4 according as he hath chosen us what's the next two words in him before the foundation of the world You've, you've got to learn how to read the Bible. The word predestinate is in the Bible two times. The word predestinated is in the Bible two times. We're getting ready to read the first one there in verse 5. Now, this is a very brief study of Calvinism. The basic teaching is, since we are dead in trespasses and sin, you're going to carry that all the way to the limit and a dead person cannot respond to God. God has to quicken them and before they can respond to him. Now, I, I know I got a lot of preacher friends, and a lot of them are that close to being Calvinist, and some of them are, but they don't want to admit it because they know people take a fit if they heard them say it. And what they're saying is, you, you, we're just all a bunch of dead heathen down here until God reached down and said, bang, and quickens you, and then you, re, you, re, you come to the Lord. You believe and come to the Lord. Now, quicken means what? Made what? Alive. So what they're saying is, you are made alive before you believe. And that won't work. That ain't right. That ain't right. Now, they'll say I'm misrepresenting them, but if a dead man can't believe, 
If a dead man can't respond, if a dead man can't come to the Lord, and I, there are, I, have, I have friends that believe like that, and I have a lot of preacher friends that skirt around the edges all the time. You always know it when they start preaching stuff like this. You're wasting your time going out there knocking on these doors with the Holy Ghost ain't in it. Uh, the man's identifying himself as a Calvinist when he says that. Listen, brother, when you're out witness for the Lord, you don't have to worry about the Holy Ghost being in it. He's in it. He's in it. He promised that. That's a command of God. It ain't got nothing to do with how you feel or how you prayed or whatever. Or a man will say, I, I was dead in sin and the high sheriff of heaven come and arrested my soul. And that makes good preaching and everybody shout. But it, it gives you the impression that uh, you were just dead and couldn't do nothing. The Holy Ghost come and grabbed you and wakened you and then you come to the Lord. And that, that puts all the responsibility on God. None on you. And they'd say, you're absolutely right, Brother Danny. Salvation is of, is of the Lord. It really, 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 really is. But you have, you have to believe. Believe is not a work. One man said that. I said, well, you say somebody got to believe. They gotta... Well, they teach that the Lord quickens a person and believes for them and receives Christ for that person, basically, uh, because a dead person can't do nothing. Now, slow but very sincere, the elect in the Bible is not just a church. There's at least three or four groups in the Bible that are called elect. There's elect angels. There's elect Israel, the Old Testament. There's elect the church, saints of God like us. And there's elect saints even during the, 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 old, in the end time, the tribulation. Now let's read that verse again, real slow. According, verse 4, you looking at it? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. The key to understanding that is in him. Were you in Christ before the foundation of the world? No. When did you get in Christ? When you got saved. You were not chosen until you got saved. They have a heart attack. There are people right now listening to me. They say, you, you know, you're you chosen before the foundation of the world. It didn't say you was chosen before the foundation of the world. It said you was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You know what that means? God chose before the foundation of the world to save anybody who would trust Jesus Christ. You say, now, Brother Danny, that just don't seem like what that said. There's where you got to be careful how you read the Bible. You better be careful how you read the Bible. Let me show you a verse of scripture here. Uh, tonight, if I if I, I think I I wrote down a reference here, I'd like to to show you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think we're it's in Luke. Uh, my goodness, I had it here in Luke. I might have wrote it down over here. Uh, Luke. Uh, mm, thought I had it wrote down here. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, Luke eight. Look at chapter Luke chapter eight. Let's all look at Luke chapter 8. This is worth taking a minute here to, uh, to study here tonight. Luke chapter number 8. And we'll look at verse uh, uh, 18. Luke chapter 8, verse number 18. That's what we're going to do. We'll study here a little bit now. You'll need this one day. Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Here the Lord warned these people, Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. Did you know that the Bible can be a dangerous book if a person don't understand it right and misuses it? That's how they start wars. Uh, you know, communism based on Bible scripture. You know, Hitler and all them—they based all them crazy people had verses of scripture. Charles Manson had scripture. The Bible's an extremely dangerous. It's like a chainsaw. I told you over and over and over. Bible's like a, a man that don't know how to read the Bible. He's like a chainsaw. He tear that pen all the pieces. That, that grand piano, tear it all to pieces. A man that knows how to use a chainsaw can chisel out a, a, a smoky bear, brother, out of a stump. So that's the way the Bible is. You've got to know how to read it. Take heed how you hear. That means when you read the Bible, you pray and say, Lord, I think, I think every time I pray, every time I read the Bible, every morning, every morning, I said 365 days a year, every day of my life, 
I bow my head and I say, Lord, speak to me through your word. Bless it. And I ask him to help me. Every time I go to church, I pray. And you should. It doesn't matter who's preaching. Count me. Lord, speak to me through your word and let that man say what I need to hear. And then sort it out. Eat the chicken, leave the bones to the plate. And you better take heed how you hear. And what happens to a lot of people, they hear somebody say something and they have scripture and they just swallow it. Then after you get into something like this, you can get out. It's it's harder to it's harder it's harder to get somebody out of something than it is somebody don't know nothing. It's it's easier to talk to a person who don't know nothing about the Bible than it's somebody screwed up about the Bible. It sure is. Everybody knows that. And so uh, that's what the, that's what you got to be careful. This uh, this doctrine of Calvinism. The basic teaching is, as I said, man is dead in trespasses and trespasses and sin. That's true. And a man cannot, even will, even though it says whosoever will, even though it says whosoever, a man cannot will to receive Christ. God has to quicken him and give him the ability, then he can come. Now, uh, I have a few questions for them, and I'm going to read some more scripture. We're back in Ephesians chapter 1. I'd, I'd like to ask a, uh, uh, a Calvinist, they would accuse us of not studying, I have I have read a book by Arthur W. Pink. Most of the Baptists that we know get their their uh, Calvinistic views from Arthur Pink, and then they, they blame it on Charles Spurgeon. They say he was a great Baptist preacher and he was a Calvinist, and uh, they'll pick out several, one out of twenty of his sermons where he had a Calvinistic flavor, moderate Calvinism, what they call it, and they'll publish that and don't publish the other eighty where he preached for results and preached salvation and preached it right. Charles Spurgeon was a moderate Calvinist, as all real evangelists are. What do I mean by that? I mean, a real evangelist, we do believe that the Holy Spirit must deal with a person. We do believe a person has to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. We do not believe he just picks out certain ones and convicts them and says, heck, everybody else. See, so Charles Spurgeon... Uh, they say that 20% of his sermons had a Calvinistic flavor, and the other 80% is what he built that church off of, the Metropolitan Pulpit uh, there. You can read hundreds of sermons by Charles Spurgeon. John, they got that, uh, Arthur Pink got that from uh, the old hard-shell uh, Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. And Arthur Pink wrote his books, and I know bunch of preachers. I used to I used to have fellowship with a bunch of them. And they said, man, if you read Pink's book on this, you read Pink's book on that. So I got me some Alpha W. Pink books, and I read them. And he's got some good stuff in there. I'm, when Jack Howell said God ought to read them books, he said he'd found types and illustrations the Lord had never found. Uh, but but he, he did have some stuff. I mean, brilliant, man. He really, he really was. But he's off on this. And the Bible says great men are not always wise. But don't forget that. Don't forget that. So here's my question to a true blue Calvinist. If God has already picked out before the foundation of the world who's going to be saved, and by the way, you can't choose who is going to be saved without automatically choosing who ain't. Now, they won't admit that. No, he didn't choose people to go to hell. You, you can't choose which ones are going to heaven without automatically letting the rest of them go to hell. Now, my question is this. If I had a Calvinist sitting right here, sitting right here tonight, I'd like an answer to this question. D are all babies who die elect? Every single baby in the world that dies, are they the elect? If he says, yeah, then we think, Lord, you'd be better off to die when you're a baby. If he says, no, that means some babies go to hell. That's right. That's right. And the truth is, real, the old time Calvinists, they believe that a baby had to be sprinkled into their Calvinistic uh, theology in order to be protected and be, be a part of the elect. So, in my opinion, any, any doctrine that teaches a baby goes to hell is a false doctrine. Any doctrine that teaches, I mean, a baby? I mean, good night in the morning, y'all. Uh, they say, well, they all go to heaven. Every single baby in the world that's ever died went to heaven. That's what I believe. I believe they did. But they're saying they're all the elect. 
So if they'd have grown up, they'd have still been the elect and they'd have got saved. Now, you know what the Bible says me and you were before we got saved? It said in Ephesians 2, I believe it said, we were without hope. We were without hope. Look, people, if your name was in the book of life from the foundation of the world, sent at the foundation of the world, and you were chosen in Christ all your before you was ever saved, you were not without hope. You were never without hope. Can you all understand that? I see a few of you nodding your head. If, if the Lord chose you before the foundation of the world to save you, and you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, you were never without hope. You know what one man said? I said, well, see, they were without hope there. So you got saved. He said, well, you had hope. You just didn't know it. So all them years, I'm not, all them years when I was out there living in sin, there was no way I could go to hell because I was the elect. Impossible for me to go to hell. I had all kinds of hope. I just didn't know it. Then when I got saved, I realized that I was chosen before the foundation of the world. That's foolishness. Now, we could have preachers in here that could dress that thing up and preach it so smooth, it'd have half of you swallowed it. Because the way they just smooth it up and by fair speeches uh, uh, lead you astray and, and fair words. and good, I'm just cut and dried, right to the point. I, 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 I get it down to the basic common denominator of, look, you believe babies go to hell? No. So all of them that dies are elect. That's a, that's a weird thing. You know what? You know what Charles Wesley said about Calvinism? The great Charles Wesley, quote, O oh, horrible decree, worthy of the place from which it came. Forgive their hellish blasphemy that it charge it to the Lamb. He said, that's some hard shell Baptist. He said, uh, he said, that's hellish blasphemy to say the Lamb. Uh is responsible for, for people going to hell. A sinner cannot receive Christ of his own will, so the Spirit quickens him, and then he comes to the Lord, repents and comes to the Lord. Now, let's turn to the Second Peter chapter 2 here, just a second here tonight. And we uh, nailed down just a few more scriptures. I know there are probably people listening to me right now saying, what about this? And uh, what about where it says, he that really is in Romans chapter 9, Pharaoh, and all of this kind of thing. It's always, always, always based on foreknowledge. Predestination is always preceded by foreknowledge. God foreknew. God already knew what was going to happen. That's what he did with Pharaoh. God didn't raise up Pharaoh just to damn him. He knew what Pharaoh would do and then acted accordingly. Now, what they say is, keep your keep finger in 1 Peter 2. Uh, what they say is, here, here's their deal. And I've studied enough of it to know this. They say, if you preach like we do, Jesus shed his blood and died for all them sinners and they rejected it and went to hell, he, he failed. Jesus somehow failed. So that's, where limited, that's what limited atonement means. I didn't give you the tulip definition yet, did I? Uh, a a five-point Calvinist is what they call a tulip. And you can't, you can't, you can't be a two-point or a three-point without being a five point. You can be a one point, which is the last one, perseverance of the saint, but you can't believe any of the other ones without believing all five. Here's the definition of tulip. This is what they call a Calvinist. T, total depravity. That means a man is capable of nothing good. Even, but the Bible don't say that we're totally depraved, that we can't will, that we don't have a will. Free, uh, Total depravity is not a Bible term. Free will is. Free will is in the Bible. Now, total depravity, you, unconditional election. The you in tulip means unconditional election. Now, people that are, that all the Pentecostals and free will Baptists and all them good, good, fine folks, love the Lord, a lot of them, but they're the opposite. They're a dandelion. Now, he loves me, now he don't. He, he loves me, now he loves me. Loves me not, loves me, loves me not. Now, either, neither one of them is right. A tulip is T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement. That means Jesus shed his blood only for the elect. Now, immediately, you're going to say this. Well, don't the Bible say it's not God's will that any should perish? Immediately. say so you're going to think like that. 
And they would say, that means any of the elect should perish. Uh, so, and you've heard, how many times have you heard me get up here and say this? When a person has to add a, ver a word to a verse of scripture to get it teach what they believe, there's something wrong with what they believe. And they add the word elect, same thing as uh, for God so loved the world. So they believe it means God so loved the elect world. See that? God so loved the elect world. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now let's look at 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. They ain't saved. Even as there be false teachers, they ain't saved. Among you who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies. We're talking about one tonight. Even denying the Lord that what? Bought them. Look at that. Bought them. Make sure you see that word bought them. The blood of Jesus Christ bought false prophets and false teachers and paid for their sins. And they are not elect. They are not. Uh, so a hyper-Calvinist overemphasized the teaching of John Calvin. Now, John Calvin, like they say, was a shining light in his day. He had some good teachings. And the Puritans and some of them people, they had some good, some good, but not this. This, this ain't right. That ain't right. And uh, uh, that, that uh, when, when you take, uh, if, you're, if a man's a, a real five-point hyper-Calvinist, John Calvin believed in sprinkling babies, brought them in the covenant of grace, and they had a guy burned at the stake uh, for not agreeing with them. Uh, you better be careful saying I'm a Calvinist. The real John Calvin believe some stuff which I, I doubt seriously if, if many of you do. But uh, anyway, I still want somebody to answer me that question. Maybe some of you geniuses online who think I'm just an old ignorant hillbilly can tell us, do all babies who die go to heaven? Yes or no? Not a two-hour, not 14 paragraphs. Yes or no? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, you can't receive Christ of your own will is what they teach. So God quickens you and does it for you. Uh, now they say, well, it's, it's God that worketh in you both the will. and the, Well, that's talking about a saved person serving him. That has nothing to do with anybody getting saved. That verse has nothing to do with anybody being saved. Uh, collect, uh, let's turn to 1 Peter since we're that close. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to have to hurry here and get finished here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1, and uh, look at, uh, let's see here. Verse 2, verse 2, 1 Peter 2, 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So God already knew. Now, what does he do according to the foreknowledge of God? Through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ, grace be in you. When, when do you get sanctified and be obedient to the Spirit? When you get saved. You are not, you are not saved before you get saved. You are not saved before you get born. That if you're quickened before you believe, you're born again before you can believe. Now, you can't be born again before you believe. That's how you that's how you get born again by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You you believe then and, and you're born again. They teach that you're quickened, made alive. Then you believe. That's backwards. That 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 won't work. Now, uh, let's uh, let's go back to Ephesians one because I know there are some of them screaming probably that I left out their favorite verse, like you know, First Timothy two four, who I have all men to be saved. That's all the elect, according to them. Uh, are they screaming about Romans nine or? We'll, we'll get to that. We may have to wait next week. But look at Ephesians again now. Verse 5. Having predestinated us. Who? The one that got that in Christ in verse 4. Under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now look. According to the Bible. You are not predestinated until you're in Christ. The second you get in Jesus Christ. You are predestinated to become the form of the, conform the image of his son. 
You have a place in heaven. You have a reservation made. And you have your, your just like you've got a reservation to a hotel, a reservation on an airplane, your reservation is put in. But it is not done before you're born. There, that's a false teaching. You, you're predestinated in him. It ain't like it ain't like God thought up everything and how it's going to go and everything that goes on is going according to his divine decrees. No, it's not. And that don't make him a failure or any less God. It means he gives us a free will and we can mess it up if we want to. And most people do. So uh, that verse says, he hath chosen us in him, verse 4, before the foundation of the world. You are not in him at the foundation of the world. He chose before the foundation of the world to, to, to save anybody who would trust Christ. You say, well, why is it worded like? I can see how somebody can draw that conclusion because they don't read it right. And that's why I said pray before you read the Bible. If you don't pray before you read the Bible, the devil will throw you a curve if you ain't careful. I've seen it a hundred times. People say, well, the Bible says this, and they're looking at it wrong. You, you're not only supposed to read the Bible, you're supposed to learn how to look at it right. And get it figured out here a little, there a little, line upon line, like Brother Mike was quoting in Sunday school the other day. Uh, you you got to figure it out like that. Now, so, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right there. That'll give you enough to, to think about. And uh, the philosophical concept of total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, and uh, irresistible grace. None of them are scriptural. None of, that, not, none of them, they might be scriptural to some extent, but those terms are not mentioned in the Bible. Free will is. You have a free will to trust or reject Christ. It's amazing to me how that they teach you don't have a free will to get in Christ, but everybody that went to hell had a free will to reject him. If you had a free will to reject him, you have a free will to receive him. So, uh, that's what we're up against here in this study of Calvin. Didn't mean to spend my whole time on that, and I still didn't get through, but basically we'll, we'll give you those other three or four verses on predestination. You can turn the cameras off now uh, but before we get through. Irresistible grace. It's irresistible. You can't resist.